Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, Sunday morning 11, Central Standard Time, Sunday night 7, Wednesday night 7, Central Standard Time. So if you live on the East Coast, it'll be Eastern Time. An hour later, if you live back out in the Rocky Mountains, it'll be two hours earlier. And, uh, or at least out on the West Coast. And uh, so I'd like to read to you. We. We're on TV in a bunch of towns and cities, about 200 different ones. And I get these emails, and I've got some right here. These are people that, I just don't want to read that. All right. Todd Parker writes to us. Uh, this is a letter of condemnation. I guess he's condemning me. Uh, but we like to read them. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Could you please explain these passages of Scripture to me? Acts 10, 34 through 35, 13, 45 through 46, Romans 1, 18, 21, Romans 11, John 5, John 6, Hebrews 11, and finally Isaiah 55. I'm having a hard time connecting to it with these Scriptures. I do believe in grace through faith, but I do not believe in grace through grace. I don't know what you're even talking about, Mister. May I suggest that because of, of a hardened heart, this verse in 5 and 12 applies to you, and thus the reason for your teaching in anger and misunderstanding of God's Word. I'm angry at false teachers, particularly you. You're one of them. I have prayed daily for the softening of your heart. You're praying for the wrong thing because my heart is softened to Jesus. What you want me to have is a heart that is softened to the world, and that's not going to happen. But only you can repent. Repent means to be turned and think differently. If you don't believe in predestination, you don't believe God. And ask God for forgiveness of sin, of pride, and healing to see and hear truth. I am teaching truth. You don't understand it. God is love. Love is agape. That's walking in the commandments of God. God is not like. You understand what I'm saying? God is not affection. He's not affectionate to everybody. He only loves his wife, the church. Please let your ears hear and have a blessed day. You don't know what blessed means. Bless you when men shall hate you when they persecute you. All right. This fella is extremely arrogant. His name is Todd Radio Parker. Radio you will die in your sin if you don't repent and believe God. See, I don't believe people that hate predestination can go to that working. You may not understand. You say, man, I'm wrestling with these things. You cannot throw out the window for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You cannot throw hey, out the window, Jim. Jacob, have I loved, Esau, have I hated. You can't Jim, throw your out... your microphone's on mute. Huh? Your microphone's on mute. Your microphone is not turned on. It's on mute. Well, why didn't you tell him before now? It's on mute. It's they just caught it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then everything I just said don't count. <laughs> okay. Forget what I said. <laughs> We don't, that don't have anything to do with Todd Parker. He is a very arrogant, ignorant man. He hates predestination. Anyway, you got this letter from Todd Parker. He hates predestination, even though the Bible says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate. To be conformed to the image of his son. He hates the fact that God loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born. He hates uh, Ephesians 1 and 5, having predestinated us into the adoption of children. Adoption means to place sons. He hates that. He thinks he placed himself as a son. He hates uh, we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him. He, ha he hates the fact that God says, I create evil. 
You cannot hate predestination to go to heaven. You can be confused about it. You can say, I don't understand it. I can't quite get a hold of what it means, but it's in the Bible. You must believe it. You can't say, I've found some verses to prove this verse wrong. Can you? I heard Creflo Dollar one time said, I can, I found a verse that proves this over here wrong. Huh? All right. Bobby Platts writes to us in Laurelville, Ohio. Uh, he says, subject is thanks. Jim, Mary, and all at Grace and Truth. I just wanted to drop a quick note to stay on the mailing list. I've been a regular listener and have been watching your teachings for the past year or so. Jim's teachings have given me such a passion for studying the Word. Isn't it funny? Some people say I'm angry at the same message that other people say I love your passion. It's because you don't know you're supposed to be angry at, at wolves who try to devour the flock. The Bible commands us to do that. Nobody in America wants to be angry if they're Christians. What's really funny, all these people go to these big Baptist churches, Pentecostal and Church of Christ. We're all Christians. And behind the scene, they steal, they lie, they cheat in business and run around on each other's wives and have affairs. But I'm a Christian. See, see my smile? Mm. That's right. I find myself wanting to study and learn about the truth constantly, even to the point it affects my job performance at work. Well, you don't want it to, you can't let truth affect your job performance. Now, you might make enemies on your job because of it, but Christians should do everything with all their might. The idea of defining everything from Greek text has really lifted a weight off when it comes to defining what truth really is. Over the last seven years or so, I had belonged to two different Protestant churches where I was constantly left with a sense that things just aren't right here. It took me all seven of those years to come across one of your teachings on YouTube. When trying to come up with a reason for leaving these churches, it was always looking for the truth. There have been problems along the way. My wife of 22 years thinks I am insane for saying God doesn't love everybody. He said he didn't love everybody. He said, I hate all workers of iniquity. He said, I love Jacob and hated Esau. For they were born. He, Paul said, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He only died for his wife, and he only loves his wife, the church. He don't love the man in hell. I am hoping I can get her to at least sit down and watch one of your DVDs one of these evenings. I feel very strongly she is elect and will eventually see the truth, but I am not worried about it strangely enough. It will happen in God's time if she's elect. Sometimes it's hard to admit your wife or your husband may not be elect. I have succeeded in getting her to change from an NIV to a KJV, which I think is a huge step in the right direction. My hope is that she conform, conforms sooner rather than later as we have two small children to teach. I'm hoping someday to gain the knowledge needed to teach these things in my area because there's absolutely no truth being preached around here. Thanks for what you do, Jim and Mary. If you have advice or guidance concerning the situation with my wife and effective ways to study and learn the truth so that I can give credibility to what I am saying to folks out here in the world, not my opinion, solely based on the inspired word of God, it would be appreciated greatly. Also, looking forward to someday getting the chance to come to Grace and Truth to visit. I feel like home, even though I have never set foot in the door, and we are separated by a few hundred miles. Agape Bobby Platts. He's in Laurelville, Ohio. And Terry Graham writes to us in Battle Creek, Michigan. Hello again, Tom. I was putting together some material to share with the church. I attend on the Passover and the firstborn. I I can't find the scriptures where we are called firstborn. Well, he's predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, that we be the firstborn among many brethren. I have found that Jesus is called firstborn among many brethren. That's us, not Jesus. In Romans, the eighth chapter, no, that's the church. But nowhere that we are called the firstborn. We're called the first fruits in James 1.18. In Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate 
to be conformed. The subject is about the man being conformed to the image of Christ, that this man that's being conformed will be the firstborn. Not that Jesus will be the firstborn, but the man being conformed. The subject is for whom he did foreknow, the people he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image that you can leave out to the image. That's a prepositional phrase. So let me quote it this way. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed that he be the firstborn. We're going to conform to the image of Christ that will be the firstborn. And his likeness is that he died for his wife and we will die daily and take when he says to be the firstborn, and the firstborn was the priesthood. It's not, all these preachers come up and say that's talking about Jesus being the firstborn. He is the firstborn, but we are the firstborn because he's a priesthood and so are we. He's the Melchizedek priesthood and we are his priests. People have got that confused. Fred Greeson in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. Mr. Brown. I need to know in a nutshell what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. Blasphemy is the word blasphemos. It comes from blapto, meaning to hinder, feme, something said, or the word of God. You hinder the word of God, continue your whole lifetime. You never believe it. Therefore, that's the unforgivable sin. You're the only person I trust. The definitions, the pundits are wide and varied. Please point me to Scripture to understand this definition, I thank you in advance for your help. Fred Greeson in Sepulpa, Oklahoma. You have to define the word blaspheme. We ought to blaspheme the word of God in 1 Timothy 6 and 1. Uh, we're not to corrupt the word of God and twist it and pervert it. That's what it means. You hinder God's truth when you blaspheme. Holy Spirit's truth. Thy word is truth. So you blaspheme the word of God is what you do. You hinder the word. When you do that continually your whole lifetime, that means you're not a believer. Then from Tricky Man, I don't know who this is. Good afternoon. Could you please send the predestination series to Dr. North in Virginia? This would be greatly appreciated. The food is good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Paul Nambule. Uh, greetings from Mawali. May you please send me some of your free DVDs, please. Paul Numbule in Muzu, Malawi. I don't know where that is. Does anybody know where that is? I figured it was there, but I didn't know where there. Southeastern Africa. Then we got some phone call. Mitch Tatum called. Uh, Steve from Memphis, Ricky Jackson from Memphis, uh, Yvonne Smith, St. Paul, Minnesota, Darrell Johnson, or Darrell Johnson, Washington, D.C., Samuel Burnett, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I want to learn the Bible. I don't want to go and just hear a bunch of, bunch of something. Only since I watched you have I got hungry. Breaking down words is to be truly thirsty in the word. He said, I want, I want to learn to resurrect daily several times. All right. In other words, that's dying daily several times. Lam, Lamidi Erun from Brooklyn, New York, called uh, Johnny Lingle from Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, Raymond Peebles, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Robert Skinner, Tucson, Arizona. We got this card here from uh, Karen Breckenridge. Uh, nice, pretty little card. Warm thoughts can make the sun a little brighter, a sky a little bluer, and the world a little nicer. Thank you very much for all you do, may we always rejoice in the Lord's will. Karen Breckenridge, we love you guys. Y'all keep on watching, and that'll be enough reading. Remember our regular announcements. Uh, 
We're on TV all over the Nashville area, as well as 200 different cities and towns. We're on in Nashville, and we're on Comcast in Hendersonville, Channel 3. We try. We also like to announce that we try to help the needy. Uh, we've got a lot of needy people, believers. I told a couple this afternoon, I said, we only help needy believers, people who are involved in these truths. And uh, uh, if you want to help these people, some of them are just, some of them are not even making out a living. They're not even making a living. They're just, just uh, living on a shoestring waiting to be, waiting to be dropped into some kind of oblivious situation. Some of them are having such a hard time with medical bills and everything else. We can't, we can't uh, pay all their bills, but we can show our faith in God by doing the thing he says and helping take care of the needy believers. We've got about 10 people we give to on a regular basis and about 20 we give to on a semi-regular basis and uh, 20 altogether. And uh, if you want to help these needy people, you send a check to make it to grace and truth and put for the needy on the bottom of it. 100% of that goes to needy people. None of it goes to the ministry. Certainly none of it goes to me. And uh, we also, uh, if you want to send a gift card, you can send those. And that helps these people. Pick them up, pick up a gift card anywhere at the store, drugstore, grocery store. All right. Well, I can see everybody that's here. <laughs> Good to see everybody here. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Mary's having a hard time with her blood pressure. It's been just, she's been saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. And uh, it just, she woke up one night, it was, real high just in the middle of the night for no reason or for God's reason we don't know why she just struggles with it a lot It's Wednesday night, and we're in a study on the history of Israel. <clears throat> you say, Jim, what's, why do we study the history of Israel? I believe that what you need is to understand, as have a full understanding of the Bible from beginning to end. I want you to have a grasp of a general picture of what the Bible's about. The Bible is one panoramic story. It's just one story about one family. And it begins in Genesis. In Genesis. And, and it takes us. It's just a panoramic view. My pen's not working. Hold on a second. See if it's working down here. It's a panoramic view. When I say panoramic, Pan was the god of the highways. He was, the, he was called the god of all. That's what he was called. And Pan was the gods of the roads and the gods of the fields. He was one of the gods that they would say, he was the god that was all in all. And any time Paul would say, Christ is all in all, it was more or less a put down of the gods that they served that were parallel to the gods Pan, who was all. Whenever we say you pan the audience with a camera, you get all the audience. You pan the audience. Whenever I say panoramic, I'm saying it's like taking a picture of all the Bible. It's like one picture, one picture. 
That's what it is. People need to learn that. It's about the story of a family, and that family is Israel. But Israel had a beginning. Uh, what became Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel in the Genesis, the 32nd chapter. And then his father was Isaac. And this is the, this is the covenant family of God. Isaac's father was Abraham. Then when you trace Abraham back in the 11th chapter uh, through his father Terah, and his father and his father's father, and you go back up here through Serug and Ryu, and and uh, this family line takes you back to Arphaxed, the son of Shem, and then Shem was the son of Noah, and Noah Noah's lineage takes you back to Adam in Genesis. These are all one family, and it's all Israel, Israel. And every event of the Bible is about this family. And this family became a nation. So whenever you talk about Israel, you're talking about a nation that's a family. It's one bloodline. That's the one flesh. At the end of time, God's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh. And that will be the Gentile church or spiritual Israel. And I believe that's one story, isn't it? And then he... He uh, gives Abraham a land, gives Abraham the land of what we call Israel. It's called Canaan back then. Canaan. And when he gives them this land, well, of course, by the time you get to jo Jacob's 11th son, he ends up in Egypt. In Egypt. Then when he's... When he... In, all of Israel is in Egypt 400 years. And at the end of the 400 years in Exodus, the 12th chapter, this is the first Passover. This is the end. This is the end of 10 plagues on Egypt. And this is the plague that God uses to soften the heart of Pharaoh. And then, then Israel escapes Egypt. And then God hardens Pharaoh's heart again so that he will pursue the the Israelites Israelites which are which are the same thing as this lineage that goes all the way back to Adam this is Adam's family not the Adam's family that's another group but this is Adam's family and uh, and of course the Israelites they leave and they're coming back to the land of Israel and that's the 12 sons, and they each have a tribe. And they each have a tribe. And, you, and then when they get back to Israel, they end, up, they end up going into the land, and Joshua leads them into the land, and God doesn't allow Moses to go into the land. We know all of that story. So he leads them into the land, and that's the book of Joshua. And Joshua starts conquering the cities in that land, just uh, bunches of cities. Uh, two of the highlight cities was uh, Jericho and Ai. Those are two prominent cities uh, because of the battles there. And then they conquers all the land, and then he tells them to go in and possess the land in Judges. Completely possess the land in Judges. Well, they're under the reason it's called the book of Judges is because Israel doesn't do the things that God says do. When they go into the land and judges the first chapter, God tells them to drive all the people out. They're pagans. Where did these people come from that are in the land of Israel or in the land of Canaan? All the time, when God gives the land to Abraham, all the time they're in in Egypt for 400 years, all of these pagan tribes come wandering into Israel. Uh, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, all of these ites come in and possess the land. And God tells Israel, these are all sun and tree worshipers. Do not go in and live among them, and especially don't give your sons to their daughters, nor their daughters to your sons, because if you do, your kids will start and your grandkids will start worshiping these idols. Well, that's exactly what Israel did. They, 
when a new, when a, in the second chapter of Judges, when a new Joshua dies, Joshua dies, and when he dies, a new generation rises up in Israel that doesn't know Jehovah God, and they start going after Baal and Ashtaroth and the grove and Shemosh and Molech and all this. And what God would do, he would put them under a judge. You started off with the first judge, which was Joshua. The second judge was Othniel. And that was the nephew of Caleb. And then you had Ehud. Ehud was a left-handed man. The Jews said if you were left-handed, you were evil. And God said, I'll give you a left-handed man to deliver you. He would raise up these righteous judges. And when he would raise them up, they would conquer the enemy. God would turn them over to their to the Philistines or one of these pagans that was inhabiting the land because they didn't drive them out. Well, he'd turn them over to these to these Philistines or to these Amorites or Hittites, and they would oppress Israel, and then Israel would cry out to God, Oh, God, deliver us. So he'd send Ehud along, and Ehud would kill their enemies and lead them out of, out of oppression. And as soon as Ehud would die, they'd go right back after these gods, Baal and the Grove and Ashtaroth. <laughs> it's, I, you say, I don't understand Israel. I don't understand America. Because they do the same thing. And as soon as, as soon as Ehud would die, he would send Shamgar. And Shamgar would... And they would be crying, oh, God, deliver us. And Shamgar would come along and deliver them. And then when he died, they'd take off after Baal and the grove and Shemosh and Molech. That, there's no understanding that, is there? And then he'd send, they didn't like having, a, they said women leaders were just worthless. So God says, okay, just for that, I'll send you a woman to deliver you. What do you think of that? Huh? They would cry out and he'd say, okay, here's Deborah. And then when Deborah died, they'd take off after Baal in a grove and Shemosh and Molech. Why do you think that God didn't, God scattered them all over the creation in the world? Well, then he would come up with people like Gideon. People would cry out and say, oh, Lord, the Midianites, the Midianites are after us. And they're oppressing us. He would turn them over to these people. Each time they would go after these gods and then they'd cry out and he'd send them a deliverer. And Gideon goes throughout the land and pulls down all the Baal and the Grove gods. And then Gideon dies and he's got a son that takes over and his son wants to be king. His son was wicked and evil and his son was Ahimelech. And he was the son of Gideon. And he was very wicked and evil. And he, while he was the leader of Israel, he, they got in a fight one day with the enemy. I believe it was the Philistines. And a woman picked up a lava rock and hit Ahimelech in the head. And he knew he was dying. And he said, someone drive a, a spear through me and kill me. I don't want it said that a woman killed me. <laughs> He's funny. I don't think we'll see him in heaven. If we did, I'd say, what were you thinking about, boy? <laughs> and it was a shame for a woman to kill a man in battle. Oh, then you have Jephthah. And the people go back after Baal and the grove and Shemosh and Molech and and Ashtaroth, and they keep on. And they, by the way, these are the same gods that Constantine brought in the church and renamed Christ Mass. You know, like, you know, like, all we know that they're the same gods as the Christ Mass gods of the, of the Feast of Saturn, of the gods of the Visigoths and the Huns and the Vandals, because all idolatry, all idolatry, started Revelation 17 and 5. Babylon is the mother of harlots, so all idolatry of the world, all idolatry has a common source, Babylon. 
in the first dynasty is in Genesis 11. In Genesis 11, 4, their doctrine was self, let us make us a name. And all these gods were, all these gods were, were just an imagination of selves. They were just a product of their own imagination. So, you get down to the, of course, Jephthah was a son of a harlot, and they said, we got to get Jephthah out of the land. He's a disgrace to Israel. Remove him from the land. Well, he's removed the land, and their enemies come in on top of them. And the only thing is, Jephthah is a great organizer and a great military leader and a general. Whew. Those generals could amass, they could, those guys, those commanders could amass an army quickly, and Jephthah was good at it. And they said, we've got to have a leader. Look, go, somebody go get Jephthah now. See, they threw him out because his mother, he was the son of a harlot. He was a bastard son. And then finally we get up there to Tola and Zaire and a bunch of others. And as soon as they would die, they'd go after Baal and the Grove and Shemosh and Molech. And, and then finally we get a man named Samson. And Samson is one of the last judges, and he killed more Philistines in his death. Samson had a woman problem. He couldn't stay away from women. It wasn't just Delilah. It wasn't all it was. He liked the Philistine women. And then we have the last judge in Israel, Samuel. And then after Samuel, Israel keeps going after Bell in the Grove in the book of Samuel. And Samuel's got two sons. And first Samuel starts here. So you go out of the book of Judges legitimately into first Samuel. Now, 1 Samuel is the book of the kings, First and Second Samuel, Kings and Chronicles. And I want you to learn to understand what this book is about. I'm here to teach you the Bible so that when I'm dead and going, and that may not be very far down the road, you, you're not going to be here that long. I'm not going to be here that long. I know that. I mean, I'm in my early 70s, mid-70s now. And, uh, and I don't expect to live another 20 years. 15 might I'll watch my body start giving away in the next 10 years do you know I've watched Milton he came here at 84 or 85 he was as chipper as he could be walked around with a clip you know just a boogie and old guy you know <laughs> and I've watched him just deteriorate in these last three years or so and that's going to happen to me and it happens to everybody it's going to happen to you when you get old enough and I'm here so you can learn the Bible. Of course, you come out of Judges, you get into 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. When you get into this, this is Israel as a kingdom. Under kings, from Saul, 1 King, until Zedekiah, the last king. And here they are right here. This is them. Yeah, I've, put, I've shown you this so many times, but I believe if I show it to you enough, you'll start to get a hold of this. Here's all the kings right here from Saul. Around 1096 is when Saul starts. Around 1096 B.C. All the way to 586 B.C. That's 510 years. They were a kingdom, and they went after Baal, Grove, Shemosh, Molech, and they kept doing that. And God says, that's it. I'm going to scatter you over the earth. And he scatters them all over the earth. And he gives them 70 times 7 or 70 weeks. They had a sabbatical year every seven years. And every seven years, they would uh, have a Sabbath year where they had to land, to land rest and they couldn't plant or, or reap any crops. The fig trees couldn't be shaken at all. They couldn't, they couldn't get out and gather the fruit that grew that year or any crops that grew on its own. They had to leave it all there for the poor, poor and the needy and the cattle of the field. Anybody who wanted to eat got to eat in their fields. And they'd said, we're not going to do that. So they had 70 sets of these sabbatical years 
than ever kept and you can find these sabbatical years in Leviticus the 25th chapter and you'll find in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 29 and Zechariah the first chapter you'll find that Israel and in 2 Chronicles the 36th chapter right at the end of the chapter you'll find that Israel's got 70 years that they're going to be in Babylon because all the time they're a nation they never kept God's sabbatical years and if, you, if they didn't do that then they went after other gods as well so they so God scatters them all over the earth wouldn't it be 72 Sabbaths 510 years no 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 <laughs> and that's what not what the Bible says we're not talking about how many years they were a kingdom we're talking about the number of years they never kept Sabbath they never kept Sabbath for 70 sets of these sabbatical years in fact, you can look at it very quickly. Look over here in Jeremiah. Well, look at Second Samuel 36. Second Samuel 36. They were just they were a nation actually about 800 years. 800, about 800. 300 years under judges and 500 years under 500 approximately under kings under kings and he says here when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and carries them away into captivity here in this 36th chapter the king of the Chaldees in verse 11 comes uh, verse 17 comes in and carries them all away 36th chapter of what book? of second chronicles second chronicles second chronicles therefore he brought upon them upon Israel this is the end of the kingdom of Israel this is the end. This is Nebuchadnezzar coming in to carry him away. Then the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his princes and all these he brought to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar carried him away. And they burnt the house of God, that's the temple, and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces there with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away from Babylon where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, which will be in 539. That's when they overthrow the Babylonian king. And here's why they're carried away to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score score is, six, is 20 three score is 60 and 10 years that's 70 years and he says the same thing over in Jeremiah now I'm going to go through this when I teach on the 70 weeks of Daniel in Jeremiah 25 Jeremiah 25 some of the kings, David, surely kept the sabbatical years. Some of the kings were righteous, but others weren't. So in Jeremiah, and I don't know whether God is counting the years of the judges or if he's just counting the years of the kings, probably just the years of the kings. And he says here in Jeremiah 25, and I'll go through this thoroughly when I teach on the 70 weeks of Daniel. I'll be doing that pretty soon. All right, Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah's preaching to Israel about their finality and about their demise. And he says in verse 12, And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. Look over here in chapter 29. He tells them in 29, I'm going to have you carried away into Babylon because of all these gods you went after when I'm the one that led you out of Egypt. And he says uh, for him to go to Egypt, to build houses, verse 5, dwell in them, plant gardens and eat the fruit, take wives, beget sons and daughters. You're going to be over there for a long time in Babylon. For thus saith the Lord in verse 8, the God of Israel, let not your prophets or your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you and don't hearken unto your, their dreams which you cause to be dreamed for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name I have not sent them saith the Lord for thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon 
I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. And then over there in Zechariah, the first chapter, that's the next to the last book of the Old Testament. And this is talking about the 70 weeks. Uh, the 70 weeks are found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. I didn't mean to get on this subject tonight. Uh, that 77s are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to do six things. And that's in Daniel 9, 24. Uh, then uh, here in verse 12 of Zechariah 1, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem? Now Zechariah is prophesying in 520. This is during the reign. This is during the second year of the reign of Darius. This is in 520, Darius ascended the throne in 522. And on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation, these three score and ten years, that's 70 years, are determined upon them. And he tells you about that over in the book of Daniel. And I'm going to be teaching on this 70 weeks when we get back to it, Daniel 9. Daniel 9, Daniel is praying to God about these verses in Jeremiah 25 and 29. And in verse chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, that's in 522, the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes. Ahasuerus is the same as Xerxes in history, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. This is Daniel speaking. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And we see in chapter 9 later, Daniel cries out to God and prays to him, says, how long are we going to be here? And he sends Gabriel about the time of the evening oblation, which is evening sacrifice so right about right before sundown they offer a lamb and a bread offering that's an oblation and he says there's a man called gabriel the man gabriel comes and talks to him and he says while i was speaking in prayer even the man gabriel verse 21 whom i'd seen in a vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation and he informed me and talked with me and said oh daniel I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding to answer the prayer that you've been praying to me all through this chapter about how long are we going to be in this captivity. They went into captivity in 586. This is approximately 522. So this is considerably later. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand in the matter and consider the vision. Seventy not weeks, but sevens. It's actually Shabua, S-H-A-B-U-A-H. Seventy sevens. They're weeks of years is what they are. Seventy times seven, that's 490 years. And I'm not going to go through all this. I'm just simply showing you this 70 weeks, and it goes, he says, 70 weeks are determined to do six things here, to finish the transgression of Israel, going after these idol gods to make an end of their sins, to make reconciliation. Kafar is the word reconciliation. The same word as atonement. Uh, the same word is pitch. The ark within and out with pitch. Same word is pitch, to cover. For iniquity, bring an everlasting right to seal up the vision of prophets and not the most holy. And he tells you how it starts from the going forth commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince. will be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. That'll be... 69 weeks or 483 years with one week to go at the end of time. And I'm not going to go into that right now. Now, I'll be going through the 70 weeks on Sunday morning as soon as I finish this tongue series. It is another one of the, it's another one of the uh, responses to Israel being scattered. We said tongues was a response to Israel being scattered. And that's gloss and dialectos or dialects. And the 70 weeks was God's response to Israel's uh, unrepentant hearts. So he gives them, in fact, he says that verse 25 takes us up to New Testament times. 
because he says, Know therefore and understand from the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That happened in 444 B.C. That is when Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah a decree to go back there in Nehemiah, the second chapter, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And when he gives him that, uh, he's there for 12 years. And from the going forth of that commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the prince. A prince is a, a prince is the son of a king to become king. And they were saying, God save the king, Hosanna, which means God save. God save the king in Luke the, in Luke the 19th chapter. And in that 19th chapter, they're saying God save the king. And the Pharisees are saying, hey, you tell them not to say that you're the king. You tell them that that's wrong. And Jesus said, if I tell them to stop, even the stones would cry out. And we are lively stones built up in spiritual house. We'll cry out and say this anyway. So this is the end of the 69th week when he comes in Jerusalem. The 70th, the 70th comes at the end of time. I'm going to go into this in great detail. It might the last series I did on the 70 weeks of Daniel took me 18 months on Sunday morning. We have to cover the entire book of Ezra, the entire book of Nehemiah. We've got to cover a whole lot of Israel's history when they keep going after Baal and the Grove. Well, this takes us into the New Testament, this 26th verse. Because he blinds their eyes, if thou hast known even thou in this thy day, there in Luke 19, the things that belong to thy peace, but now they're blind. Now you're blinded. I'm opening up my spirit to all flesh. This is four days before the Passover when he comes in right here. Four days. And then we go into, as of the end of the 69th week, we go into all flesh. Time for all flesh are the last days. Our Gentile church, a day of the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. And we go in and the church is Israel, is spiritual. But Israel has always been spiritual. The church, the New Testament church, resumes Israel. It doesn't replace Israel. This is not replacement theology. I hate that term, replacement theology, because we are the church. We are spiritual Israel. God says, oh, a Jew is not out with but of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. We were strangers from the covenants of promise, from the Jewish commonwealth, from the from the citizenship there in Ephesians, the second chapter. We were strangers, but now we're no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with Israel and in, with those believing Jews that are in Israel. So that will take us to the end of time. This is one story. Can you see that? It's one story. And uh, the 70 weeks takes us into the New Testament. Now, let's go back where we were where we are we are in and every once in a while I'll review this is a review of the Old Testament all we're going to do is study as we go through the Old Testament I don't believe people need three points in a poem when you go to these churches they say we're going to give you three points of how that you can be a better Christian first of all you need to think about Jesus every day and they never, never tell you what to think about him and you need to make God your priority, and you also need to uh, uh, be sure and pray daily. They don't tell you what prayer is. They don't know what making God your priority is. They don't tell you any of the things they say has no meaning. They give you some English words. You have no idea what was meant. I was listening to Charles Stanley yesterday, and I'm sitting there bored out of my mind, but I'm listening to whatever he has to say. And he's talking along there, and he says, and Nebuchadnezzar was put down on his all fours, and then we see uh, Babylon is coming in to overthrow, and then uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son is Belshazzar. I thought, what? I thought, that shows how little study. Belshazzar was not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar's father was Nebonidas. But since he only sees, it showed me just how showed me just how little he studies. You've got Nebuchadnezzar, then you've got his son, Evil Merodach, 
and then his son on down the line, and then Nabonidus overthrows one of these in the lineage, and about six or eight kings down the line is Nabonidus, and his son is Belshazzar. And I thought, boy, how ignorant is this man to tell people, and he said it several times, that Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's son. It's because he just sees that in the book of Daniel. Here you got Nebuchadnezzar, and then you got Belshazzar. He doesn't have all the kings listed. When you start off with Cyrus, the king of Persia that conquers Babylon, he wasn't the first king of Persia. God gives us in the Bible the characters that are profitable for us to learn. I gave you, you remember that Sunday morning I gave each one of you a chart and it had the kings of Babylon. It's got Nebuchadnezzar being the first king that conquers and becomes an empire, but he's not the first king. And Belshazzar wasn't his son. You have to understand, everything in the Bible is not uh, in a, it's systematic, but it's not necessarily in a chronological order. Oh, look, let me show you something. Look over here in Daniel Daniel, the Daniel, the fifth chapter. Now look here. In Daniel, the fifth chapter, Belshazzar, the king, made a feast, and he sees the finger of a man's hand right up on the wall. Well, Belshazzar is the last king of Babylon. He, and in this chapter, he dies. Right? And that's the night that the Persian king, that's the night that Cyrus, the Persian emperor, comes down. Babylon was on the Euphrates. Here's the Euphrates. Here's the Tigris here. And they meet right down here, just about 100 miles above the Persian Gulf. Persian Gulf. Babylon is in what we call Iraq. And Nineveh was what we call Iraq. And this is all the Babylonian uh, empire back in that day and time. Well, Persia, where Cyrus is king, that is modern day Iran. So Iran or Persia is going to attack Babylon. But Babylon, the, you have the kingdom of Babylon and you have the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon is the mother of harlots. And she sits on the Euphrates River. If you looked at Babylon from the top, it, it straddled the river half on one side, half on the other, and they had a tier bridge that walked across. It was seven-tier bridge. Seven-tier bridge at Ross that spanned the Babylon River. I don't know how I got into all this. Goodness, I shouldn't have started reviewing the Old Testament. <laughs> but if you looked at it from the top, Euphrates is a river not unlike the Mississippi. It's a big, huge river. And it's a long way across the river. Well, they built this Babylon. It reminds me of building a house on the sand. They built it on a river, and they had a moat around it, and the river went around it and through it. And this river that went around it, it's the same river, and the moat around it where the river ran was about 390 feet deep. And the walls that protected it were about 385, 90 feet high. They said, we are unconquerable. We can be conquered. Well, there was a, they had a two-leaf gate that went down to the river. They could open the gate and women could go down to the river and wash their clothes. Well, Cyrus of Persia, what we call Iran, not Cyprus, Cyrus. Cyrus, 
he says, you say you can't be conquered? He made it fairly easy. He took a large crew of men, probably several thousand men, and went up north of Babylon and diverted the river, built the dam to divert the river out into the Arabian Desert. And the Arabian Desert is hundreds of millions of square miles. How much of that river can you put in the Arabian Desert? All you want to put in it. It's going to keep soaking it. And Cyrus comes over here. This is not just historically true. Herodotus tells us about it in his history. But you find this in the 44th and 45th chapter of Isaiah. That Cyrus comes over here, dries the river up, marches down the riverbed. <clears throat> and this is how he conquered Babylon. And this is how they become the beast system and take her over all the lands of Babylon. And they march down the riverbed when it dries up, come up to the two leave gates. And they had left those gates open because they were all in here drunk, parting with the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away years before. So they're overthrown here. Babylon's overthrown. This is 539 B.C. They're overthrown by Cyrus of Persia. And they said, we can't be conquered. Anybody has got a weak link. And theirs was they didn't realize somebody could take their river away. All they had to do was march right down the riverbed. And that's what they did. Now, so you find Belshazzar dying. He sees the writing on the wall, mene, mene. Tikal ufarsin, which means thou art weighed in the balance and found one. And that night, <clears throat> Belshazzar was killed. Okay, we'll look over here in chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and he sees the beast, the, the, the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, and the Grecian leopard, and the beast with iron teeth. Well, this is, this is an earlier period than chapter 5, isn't it? But it's later in the Bible, right? You have to pay attention. Everything, they'll tell you stories about how things happened, but they won't necessarily be in sequential events. It's because what they're doing is the same thing we do. It's okay for us to do it. It's not okay for them to do it. I can tell you, I say, well, I went to the store, and then later in the conversation, I'll say, when I went to the store, I bought some bread and milk and some eggs and some bacon. They would say they did something, then they'd come back and tell you how it happened. Or, But we do the same thing. I might say, you know, I told you I went to the store yesterday. Well, here's what I did when I went to the store. You're going to find that's in the Bible too. In fact, let's go back to where we've been studying See, this is going to take us all the way to the end of time. And this is where Cyrus takes over. And then Cyrus uh, leads until the Grecian, great Grecian general Alexander the Great conquers, conquers the Persian Empire. And then he's got four generals, Lysacomus, Castor, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And they are sub subjugated by the Roman Empire or by the beast with iron teeth. Iron is always equated with Babylon. Now, and of course, people say the God of the New Testament is not the mean God of the Old Testament. Rome is really in the New Testament. Rome is the beast. What is the beast doing? Killing Christians as fast as they can. And killing everything in sight. What do you mean? The God is in charge of the beast, isn't he? Great day. People say the God of the New Testament is not the... What do you think that Colosseum on the wall over there is about? All those Christians dying at the lions, and sometimes it would be the... That's an actual picture of the Colosseum on the right. Mike brought that back from over there, and then... Or he took that picture, I believe it was, enlarged it. 
and then that's it on the left, and they'd have the lines of the gladiators coming there and killing those Christians. Uh, I guess that's the same beast, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Now, I want you to be able to understand the entire Bible in a picture. If I could paint, I'd paint a picture of all these characters, and it would have to wrap all the way around the church several times. So, I, so we could see the picture of all this. It's a picture is what it is. Now, when we get to the 70 weeks, it's not going to be just a few words up here. The 70 weeks, I teach on it. I've, I've had about, I'll ask people once in a while, I'll say, you ever heard of the 70 weeks of Daniel? They'll say, no. I told the lady the other day, I said, that is the most uh, prominent of all the facts about prophecy. If you don't understand the 70 weeks, you don't understand the prophecy. You have to understand that to understand prophecy. When I go into the 70 weeks, it took me 18 months on one of the last, the last series. I did 11 month series some years before that. This is not an easy thing to go through, but it will give you the whole picture of prophecy and it'll point to the time of Christ's coming. We don't know the exact time. No man knows the day nor the hour. That means the exact time, but the Scripture says you're not the children of the darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, that we will see the signs and we'll understand the signs. And I believe the signs are alive and well in America. The, to me, the greatest reason to see the second coming of Christ it's not just Israel coming back. That's part of it. But the greatest sign to me is the apostasy that's in the world. And the preachers, no truth coming from their mouths. Not Billy Graham, not Charles Stanley, not Ed Young, not Adrian Rogers, not, not Jerry Falwell, not Kenneth Copeland, not, not T.D. Jakes, none of those guys. Benny Hinn is just one of the biggest liars walking in the world. So is Copeland. I don't hear any David Cross, death to self, self denial. I'll, I'll listen to those guys and I'll say, they keep talking about Jesus and God and it sounds good, but he's, they're telling everybody how good you can feel about being a Christian and being a believer. They never talk about death to self, David Cross, self denial, being hated by the world. And that's a requirement. But most of those people don't believe in predestination. Uh, they don't believe in death to self, daily cross. They don't believe that Christmas is pagan. They don't believe that Easter is pagan. And they don't believe in ever taking a stand against anybody or any doctrine of any kind. You ever listen to them and wonder, what is it they're saying? They sure do sound good, but I'm not feeling any conviction. I'm not feeling anything that makes me feel bad. It's just all you can feel good about your life in Christ. And, and you ought to feel good. And God wants you to have a, a good life and... and why don't you go preach that to the people in Calcutta, India? There's a million of them dying in the streets there. Go to Bangladesh. They're starving to death by the millions and say, God wants you to have money and he wants you to have a good Christian life. They preach that in America and we're less than 5% of the world's population. And all the rest of the world is dying. Back off into space 100,000 miles and look at the earth. We're a dot when it comes to population. Now, all the rest of the world is immersed in nothing worse than we are. We have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof, don't we? In America, this nation is not Christian. I wrestle with why. What is he saying? I listen to Chuck Swindoll. Well, gosh, he sure sounds good. And he tells some real pretty stories, and they're kind of neat. But there's no conviction. Nobody's told to die daily. Nobody's told the way you die daily is tell people some truth that makes people angry. If, and the Bible teaches, I never hear anybody saying that you're supposed to be angry. And that's an absolute commandment. In Ephesians 4, 26, concerning the winds of doctrine that make the church pull away, blinds the church, makes them apathetic, the Bible commands us to be angry. Everyone that has an ear to ear, they will be angry at the winds of doctrine. If your people accuse me of being too angry, no, that's because you're too ignorant to know that you're being lied to. I don't like anybody that lies to me. I don't like people that are liars. 
You want to get on my wrong side, just start lying to me. Billy Graham lies. Charles Stanley lies. What do you mean they lie? They're wonderful men of God. They preach about Jesus. They preach the other Jesus. They don't preach a Jesus that will make the world hate you. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it'll hate you. If it persecuted me, it'll persecute you. You're not going to be persecuted for telling people, you need to have a wonderful life in Christ, and he needs to lift you up, and you need to feel good about yourself. No, you don't. You don't need self-esteem. We need to esteem others rather than ourselves. I, I can't handle these lying preachers. You're commanded to be angry, and if you're not angry, that's an imperative mood in the Greek, be angry, or gizomai. If you're not angry, if you're never angry at anything, let me put it this way. If you're never at angry at anything spiritual or non-spiritual in churches, you're a sick believer. You're not doing the commandments of God. When God commands us to be angry, it's the same kind of command, let there be light. It will be. If you're a believer somewhere, you're going to discover that the preachers are lying and you quit saying, Jim Brown is too angry. No, I'm not too angry. I don't think I'm angry enough. If I was as angry as Nehemiah, I would be dragging these preachers out of these churches and kicking them in the tail and say, get out of here and never come back. And they'd arrest me and put me in jail for that. You read that 13th chapter of Nehemiah. You didn't mess around with him. He wouldn't put up with it. Jeremiah didn't put up with it. Well, Jeremiah was a great man of God. The people in Israel didn't think so. All the princes of Israel and all the Israelites wanted to kill him because he kept saying, judgment's coming, Nebuchadnezzar's coming. And he had a, he had a stenographer named Baruch. He had an Ethiopian eunuch named Abedmelech that would encourage him and help him. But he had no other friends. He didn't have a coliseum full of people. What if anybody ever come up with that stuff? I, am I angry? Oh, you bet your life I am. I don't like false teachers that lie to the sheep and hurt the flock. That's what I'm angry at. Not angry for myself. If it was just me they were hurting, I wouldn't care. Because I'm strong enough to take whatever they got. But you start hurting the flock and I don't like you. I'm not even supposed to like you when you hurt the sheep. You lead them astray. Jesus said, I only love you. I only have an affection for you if you keep my commandments. I don't have any affection for you, and I don't like... Jesus is saying, I don't like you if you don't keep my commandments. You're not supposed to go around liking everybody. Where'd you come up with that? Well, I just love serial killers. I love Adolf Hitler, didn't you? I just love Tilla the Hun. He murdered as fast as he could murder. I just, I just love uh, whoever that... Jesse James, he was a murderer. Now, let's go back over here where we've tried to come out of. We've got Israel coming out of Egypt. Where we are is in Exodus. Israel's leaving Egypt, Exodus, the 15th chapter. 14th chapter is where we were. The 12th chapter is the Passover, the last plague in Egypt. What God is doing, he's calling Israel. Well, I've kind of just de deferred from where I was going tonight. Now, Israel has left Egypt in the 14th chapter of Exodus. This is the, the Red Sea experience. This is where Israel has left Egypt. Here's Egypt here. Over here. It's in this area here. And then they're going over here across the Red Sea, going into this Sinai Peninsula. And in all probability, in all probability, I've explained it before, that Sinai was somewhere in this south area. Now, we know that the Galatians, the fourth chapter, says that Sinai is in Arabia. We say Arabia is over here, but I keep saying that, that uh, uh, when, they cr uh, when they cross the Red Sea, there's about two and a half million of them. 
with all the men named, the women were never numbered and children were never numbered, they're guesstimating about two and a half million people are going uh, and they come through the Red Sea. And of course, God destroys the most powerful army of the day. That's Pharaoh's army. And I titled that message last week, Pharaoh's army's got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. It's drowned is what it is. It's not drowned, drowned. That's the way the song goes. They come up to the Red Sea. And I feel like I need to explain a little more thoroughly. Moses is up against the Red Sea. The, mur the people are murmuring. We've already gone through this and showed how Pharaoh dies and how that God takes him down in the middle of the Red Sea and pulls his wheels off his chariots and drowns everybody. Then he says uh, in chapter 14, and Moses, they're up against the sea. They're standing up against the sea here, all these people. And Pharaoh's brought his armies, and they're here. And God puts this great fire between the children of Israel and Pharaoh's armies so they can't get to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel are murmuring, saying, we got these armies behind us, and we got the sea here. Yes, you got, but you got God right between them. And this, let me ask you this. Did Israel choose to do any of this? This was Moses going to Israel, who in all probability had forgotten Jehovah God in 400 years. Because even Moses said, when I go over there, now why is God going to call a people out that have forgotten him and do not know him? Maybe because some of them are his elect. They're his predestinated family. And Moses says in that fourth chapter, when I go over, or in the third chapter, excuse me, when I go over to Egypt and I say to the children of Israel, I've been sitting here by God to lead you out of bondage. He said, what if the Israelites say, well, who is this God? What's his name? Moses must have known how unfamiliar Israel was with Jehovah God because he was an Israelite and he lived among them and heard them talk and he knew what their language is about and they probably never ever mentioned Jehovah God. Now, why would God take somebody that had forgotten them, him and call them out of Egypt? You reckon maybe it's because they were his predestinated elect family and he chose them arbitrarily and they had nothing to do with choosing him? And he said that in Deuteronomy 7 and 7. He said, I chose you not because you were the greatest of nations, you were the smallest. But, but first of all, he said, I did the choosing and you've completely forgotten me. He had no reason other than his arbitrary choice to call him out, did he? And that's what predestination is about, isn't it? He's picked us. We're in a type of Egypt. He's called us out in the wilderness. And he picked us for whatever his reasons are. And he's called us out of Egypt to wander in this wilderness till he takes us into the promised land, which is a picture of heaven. Now, there in that 13th verse, I've already said some things about it. It's one of the most profound statements that's made at this beginning of this uh, this movement, this exodus out of Egypt. When they're standing there up against the Red Sea, and Moses said unto the people in verse 13, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. We said the word... Stand still is the word yatsab. It doesn't mean don't do nothing. Yatsab. Yatsab means to continue, present yourself to God and continue what you're supposed to be doing. If you had two and a half million people, you had a bunch of babies that needed to potty and you had a bunch of diapers that need changing and you had a bunch of little old ladies need to be sitting down and some of them need to be helped up and some of them were falling down and they had all these people in business of two and a half million people to tend to while they're waiting God to take care of Pharaoh. I've got several places this word 
Yatsab is used. I just want to read a couple of them to you. Look over here in 1 Samuel 12. This standstill is a, was a, used many times. Look in 1 Samuel 12. 1 Samuel 12. And this will help you what standstill means. He wasn't saying don't do nothing. 1 Samuel 12. Now this is where that Samuel is stepping down from the leadership of Israel, from being their mouth on the earth, and Saul is receiving his coronation to be the king of Israel. And Samuel is talking to him, warning them about what's going to happen to them if they go after other gods like they've done many times in the past. And he says here in verse 6, And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron and that brought your fathers out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore, stand still. Same word. He said he brought them out of Egypt when they stood still. That I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. And he warns them through this whole book. He says, you listen to me. So stand still means to listen to the instructions of God. That's what he's telling them. Stand still, be quiet, and listen to instruction. He's not saying don't do nothing. He says there's a time to listen. And this is the time. And he goes through here and tells them, he said, Israel had a king, it was God, but now you want a king to reign over you just like men have. You want a man king when God was already your king down there in verse 12. So he warns them, he even tells them, he tells them all through here, God will come after you if you're disobedient to him. This is a very important chapter in the first book of the Kings because he's, this is Samuel stepping down. The prophet was the mouth of God that went to the people and told the people. But in that eighth chapter, the people are saying, give us a king. We want a king, a man to rule over us. And Samuel warns them what's going to happen. You've had a king, it's God. He has an arsenal over here that has lightning bolts in it, that's got earthquakes in it, and you want spears and bows and arrows? And they said, yes. He says, all right, you got it. Now, look over here in, in, cha- in 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20. I just want you to understand what this standstill means. Second Chronicles, the twentieth chapter. <clears throat> now this is a chapter that really this is where that Moab and Ammon come up against Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel, to battle against him. And let me give you some of this here. And he says in verse 17, Now Ammon and Moab, this is just as much of an impossibility for Israel to beat these people. Ammon is what we call northern Jordan. Moab is what we call southern Jordan. You see, here's Israel. This is Israel. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Egypt over here. Here's Ethiopia down here. And here's the Sinai Desert. And here is Jordan. Northern Jordan is, this is all of Jordan. Ancient, in ancient times, northern Jordan was the land of Ammon. And southern Jordan is the land of Moab. Remember, Ruth was a Moabitess. She was from Moab. And Ammon is the capital city of Jordan. And this was the Ammonites. When David had his affair with Bathsheba, his army was up here fighting with the Ammonites. Here's Jerusalem down here. And they were fighting the Ammonites. And that was where that, that David sent Uriah up to 
his commander, Joab, which was his nephew, when they were in that battle and said, put Uriah the Hittite in the heat of battle and withdraw from him. I've gotten his wife pregnant. They, there's some adventurous things over there in Samuel. So that was the Ammonites. So, <clears throat> and here in verse 17, and the, the Ammonites and the Moabites are going to come up against. This is as bad a situation as you can get because these are super powerful nations at this time. They're not always super powerful. But at this point, they are. And he says in verse 17, You shall not need to fight this battle against the Ammonites and the Moabites. Set yourselves, stand you still. Set yourselves is that same word over there. In 14, stand still, yot sob. Set yourselves and see the salvation of the Lord. Same words, Moses standing on the banks of this Sea of Galilee. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. I keep saying these things. God is with us. If God be for us, who can be against us? The Lord is my helper. If he is, and you're going through hard times, and you're up against the Red Sea, or you're about to go against the Ammonites, I'm not saying God's going to make you rich, and this is not a charismatic Pentecostal message. I don't believe in that. God will make you win his way, but you won't think it's winning according to what your judgment is right now. At 30 years old, I want to be a world-famous singer and a world-famous preacher. Well, God didn't let me win that battle. He's let me win with a ministry that I never expected to have, and I'm more content in life than I've ever been because I realize predestination is true, the sovereignty of God is true, and he works all things after the counts of his own will. And he's brought me to a time here in my 70s where I will say, Anything that happens, I'll say it's the will of God. I don't get stressed out. My start, heart don't start pounding. I don't get that sour feeling in my stomach that I used to get when I worried about things. Well, I just have a few years left to live. You say, Jim, are you feeling sorry for yourself? No, I'm looking forward to going to be with the Lord for once in my life. I have someone who loves me. <laughs> Now, if once in my life I have learned to be content and I really don't care what happens anymore. My job is to preach tonight and, and after tonight's over with, I'll be thinking of Sunday morning and I'm not thinking of next month or next year. I'm doing what I can do today. And that's a hard place to come to, to learn. Take no thought for the morrow. Tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. And sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. When tomorrow gets here, there'll be enough evil to go around without you adding to it today. Quit worrying about it today. And whatever comes tomorrow is the will of God. I want us to look at this battle they're up against. This is a similar, similar battle. To, in fact, the same words are spoken here, aren't they? Same exact words. Let's read some of this chapter. And it came to pass, verse 1, after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Jehoshaphat, wonderful man of God, loved the Lord. He had some faults. He ran around with Ahab, who was a heathen, a murderer, and a killer. But because Ahab was a Jew, and he said, Jehoshaphat, you're my Jewish brother. You're king of southern Israel. I'm king of northern Israel. Would you go out here and help me? And he shouldn't have been helping Ahab do anything. But Jehoshaphat otherwise was a righteous man. He had the word of God read throughout Israel. And now Moab is going to attack Jehoshaphat. He's just the little kingdom of southern Judah. Then came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. From beyond the Sea of Galilee on this side of Syria. That's the land of Ammon, Ammon, Jordan. In that area right there, there's a great host of army coming against you. Verse 
Then came some to Josephat that came a great multitude from beyond the sea on this side of Syria. And behold, they be in Hazazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. He was a godly, righteous man. Now remember, God says when you have a righteous king, you can go against your enemy one way and they'll feed seven ways and it don't matter how many there are. In fact, he had, there were a million Ethiopians. Ethiopians. With 300 chariots of iron, iron chariots. Those were the tanks of the day. They had those scythes sticking out the wheels. They would just cut men down. They'd run over men, just cut them up like so much beef. And they were going to come against a half a million Israelites. There's no way they could beat them in Second Chronicles, the 14th chapter. And Asa was the king of Israel then. Asa was a godly, righteous man. He was the father of Jehoshaphat. He was a good man. And Asa prayed a prayer. He said, Lord, it's nothing with you to help with many or that, them that have little. It doesn't matter how little you have, God can help you get through. But it's not going to be your way. When, he, when you finish winning the battle, it's an arranged, orderly arrangement. He's going to whip you and beat you and make you realize you can't be who you think you ought to be. God doesn't listen to prayers so you can become who you want to be. He has your life arranged for you to be who he wants you to be, and he'll have to beat self out of you and make you turn around and go the other direction and say, God, this wasn't what I had in mind. He said, it's what I had in mind. You can't be going along. See, I wanted to be a, going along in music and ministry and be a world-famous preacher and be a world-famous singer. And God says, you can't go along with Jesus in the same direction. You have to turn around and go the other direction instead of this direction. You got to stop everything you do and go start following the Lord. And I don't mean quit your job. I'm saying in your mind, the first and most priority uh, you should have in your life should be Christ. And while you're at it, have a job. And while you're at it, do something. But I don't think the music world is a place for any godly believer. I don't think real estate's a good place for a godly believer. I don't think climbing the, trying to climb the ladder of success is a place for a godly believer. I believe working a job, working hard, doing the best you can do, drawing your pay, paying your rent, getting involved in church at night and on the weekends, and being everything you can be for the Lord, that's an honorable job. The work of a laboring man is sweet. The wealth of the rich will not suffer him to sleep because all he thinks about is making more money. Let's continue reading here. Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Judah is southern Israel. In Judah, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin is southern Judah or southern Israel, and they named the southern kingdom after the tribe of Judah, which was the head tribe. In fact, the king will come out of Judah, but Saul, the first king, came out of Benjamin. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, Art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? This is a righteous man, isn't he? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? I love the prayer of Asa in the 14th chapter of this same book. He says, Lord, it's nothing with you to help with many or few, let not man prevail against thee. When you're in a battle, don't pray, God, don't let my enemies prevail against me. The battle is not between you and your enemies. It's between God and your enemies. And they're not your enemies. They're God's enemies. If you're serving God, David said, Lord, you plead my cause. Plead is the word rube. It means fight or grapple my enemies for me. I can't. I've tried fighting my battle with my enemies. Have you ever tried fighting your enemies? 
You cussed him, you fussed at him, you wanted to punch him out, and you screamed at him, you went home and your stomach turned at night, and you never conquer your enemies, do you? That never works. There more come. If you come to the place and say, Lord, you conquer my enemies, get away from them, first of all. Don't hang around them. You tried to climb the ladder of success. That ladder belongs to the world. They built it. They set up the rules for it. Go try to climb that ladder. They'll kick you off of it. See, this is our ladder. This belongs to heathen. You see the sign at the top of the ladder? Heathen ladder. Don't belong to you. I, I used to think that when I was in music. My group is great. Listen to me singing. Listen to my group. We're fantastic. What does that have to do with anything? Don't you know yet that getting somewhere in the world is winning friends and influencing people? You're not going to win friends and influence them if you tell them predestination is true. God doesn't love everybody, and he may not love you. Tell that to a record producer when you're trying to get a record with his company. And don't work. Or if you're trying to climb the ladder of success with some company, that ain't going to happen. Work your job. Be content in that. Pay your bills. Pay rent, pay your car note, buy groceries, be in church every time the doors open, and learn to witness to people and take a stand. And I'm not talking about witnessing while you're supposed to be in working. There's a way to do those things to come, and we talk about it, okay? <clears throat> Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? Boy, that's the way to go to God, isn't it? Pray a prayer that said, Lord, you've already done it for your friend Abraham, and you'll do it for us, and you gave this land to your friends when you brought them out of Egypt. And they dwell therein and have built thee a sanctuary then for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, the judgment, or the pestilence, or the famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence. Those are the four judgments of God that he said he'd bring, aren't they? For thy name is this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which is just south of Israel, south of the Dead Sea. That's where Petra was, the capital city of the people of Edom. The Edomites evidently are going to join in this whom thou wouldst, wouldst not let Israel invade when they came up out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. It's not, we are not able to beat them. It's utterly impossible to beat Pharaoh's army. It's utterly impossible to beat the Ammonites and the Moabites that are accompanied by the Edomites from Mount Seir. Neither know we what to do. Have you ever been in that situation? I don't know what to do God I've been there so many times I can't count what we do is rely on the Lord I'm not saying he's going to overcome your situation by tomorrow morning or by next week or by next month but he will overcome it and he'll overcome it his way and he'll put you in a direction he wants you to go and this is not financial he'll put you in a situation where he wants you to make a living it may be a lot less than what you're anticipating because of your wondrous talents that you think you've got. You may have talent, but God's going to use you the way he wants to use you. He uses my voice not to sing with, but to preach real loud with. <laughs> and all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, with their babies, their children, their wives and children. And upon Jehazael, here's a prophet, the son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jeel, Je Je the son of Mataniah, 
a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. This Jahaziel, the Spirit of the Lord, comes upon. Is that the same Holy Spirit of the New Testament? The Holy Spirit's truth. The truth is going to come up on this Jahaziel. And he said, here's his prophecy. Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou king Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours but God's. How are you going to lose? But you have to be bound completely to the will of God. The battle is not yours, Moses. It's God's. He's going to conquer Pharaoh. Let me say to you, the battle is not yours. Just quit trying to win your way. Quit fighting your way. I have fought God more than any believer I know. I just fought at his will in my life. I thought I was fighting for his will because I wanted to be a singer and a wonderful Christian too. (laughs) You can't be what you want to be. Your life is planned by God. He works all things after the counts of his own will, and the fight is the Lord. It's not yours. So why you keep trying to fight your enemy? Quit doing that. He's laid everything out and everything. In everything, give thanks. Even when you say, we can't fight this battle, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are upon you, Lord. That's the thing to do. If he gives you a tree to sleep under, sleep under it. If he gives you a rock to sit out on, sit on it. Okay? If he gives you whatever he gives you, this is the will of God as a believer. And in time, you'll reap reward. Be not weary in well-doing. You'll reap reward in due time if you don't relax, if you don't sit down and quit. If you faint not, there in Galatians 6, tomorrow go you down against them. Verse 16, behold, they come up by the cliff Ziz, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. How much time do I have, Mike? Ye shall not need to fight this battle. Set yourselves. Stand still. God's going to fight your battle for you. You just keep busy in life. God will fight the battle. You'll end up where he wants you to end up. Quit instructing the Lord about where you want to go. Who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Prayer means to bow to the will of God. It doesn't mean to tell God what you want and order him around. That's what people think, don't they? You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still. And see the salvation of the Lord with you. Jason, sit down, please. It just bothers me for somebody to be doing something while I'm, I can't help that. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Now, who's going to win in this battle? When you bow to God in His will, you'll win. You won't win your way and when you want to. You think you're having a tougher battle than going against this many people that you cannot possibly win. Israel could not possibly win against Pharaoh. Not possible. Have you ever had a battle you didn't think you could win? Are you there right now? You've had some battles you didn't think you could win, hadn't you? Have you ever had anything like that? Well, you, you're, it's not a matter of whether you will win. Just bow to God's will and let him do the fighting. I mean, I, can, I know everybody here's had battles they didn't think they could win. Haven't you, Kathleen? I know Dave's in a battle right now. He doesn't think he could win. Dave back there on the back, he was in a battle he didn't think he could win, and he started winning, but it wasn't the direction he thought he was going to go, was it? It's never the direction. Just follow the direction of the Lord. 
don't worry about stuff. And the Levites of the children of the Korathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe in the Lord your God, and he'll establish you. Put your roots down where he wants you to be rooted. Trust God above everything. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. They're out singing praises in front of the army, going against insurmountable odds. They're praising God before the battle. Can you do that? Praise ye the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. They're going to ambush the Ammonites and the Moabites. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, uttered to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And when Judah came to toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, they were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Huh. I wonder who did that. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. I'm not saying you're going to get rich. Boy, if charismatics get a hold of this, they're going to say, hey, see, you get rich. Depend on God. No. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Barakah unto this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem, for the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets, into the house of the Lord, and the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. And that's exactly what God will do for us. Fight against our enemies. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest round about. And that's what the Bible says about Asa. He gave Asa rest. That was his father when he turned everything over to God. And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azuba, the daughter of Shilhi. And he walked in the way of Asa his father and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Howbeit the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. They had a glitch in their, they had some sin in their life. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel, and after this did Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. Jehoshaphat is such a good man, but he has a habit of running around with the wrong people. The man he joined himself to was the son of Ahab. He ran him out of Ahab, was defending him, and he'd defend Ahab, saying, you know what this is like? This is like you or I saying, well, I've got this friend, and I'm going to invite him to the house. He don't believe God, and he cusses his son, and I think I can turn his heart around if I divide him, invite him to my house to uh, have supper with me on Friday night to have a 
cookout. And you do that every Friday night. And you use this as an excuse. I'm going to reach him someday. The Bible says after the second admonition, reject these people because they're heretics and receive them not in your household. But people, I used to run around with certain people in gospel music that were heathens. They would cheat and lie and steal. And I'd say, well, I'm being their friend because I think I can help turn them around. You can't turn con men around. If they're going to be turned around, the Word of God will turn them around. You need to preach to them twice and then pull away from them and leave them alone. You're not supposed to be going after these people. Am I out of time? Seven minutes. All right. Where was I? So he joins himself to Ahaziah, the king of Israel, who did very wickedly. He wasn't joining him. Jehoshaphat was a good man. He was like a good man of God running around with the wrong people. Evil communications corrupt good morals. That word is ethos. It means ethics. You'll get corrupted if you hang around the wrong people. I've done many messages on that. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rebuke them. If, if a man there in 2 Thessalonians, that's in the 5th chapter of Ephesians in 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 and 6 and 2 and 14, if a man walks not according to this epistle, withdraw from him. And he says in verse 14, note that man, have no fellowship with him. If he's a brother, have no fellowship with him, so he'll be ashamed. If you withdraw from somebody, the Bible says men will be ashamed of themselves. If you, you can't walk with them, that was Jehoshaphat's one secret sin. It wasn't a secret sin, it was a public sin. There in that 21st chapter of, of 1 Kings, Ahab, who is a murderer, he kills Naboth, him and his wife. He brings Baal in the grove into Israel in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings. And Ahab goes down to Jehoshaphat and says, Brother, we're both Jews. You're king of southern Judah. I'm king of northern Israel. I got to go up here and fight. I got to go fight the Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. Won't you come and join me? We're brothers, aren't we? I'm a murderer, and I know I'm an idolater, and I married Jezebel, the wickedest woman in the west, and the wickedest woman in the east. And, and, but you'll come and help me, won't you? Joseph says, Okay. But I got some conditions. First of all, later on, Jehu comes to him and says, you're going to help the wicked? That's after God kills Ahab. He says, what are you doing helping the wicked? Of course, Jehu kind of falls off the wagon too. But he runs around with him. And he, at least he says, before we go into battle, I need to consult a prophet. And Ahab says, but... But you consult prophets, and no, none of them like me. They all say bad things about me. No wonder you're a killer. You're a murderer. You're a liar and a thief and a heathen and an idolater. You bring, it was because of Ahab and Jezebel that all Israel turned to Baal in the grove. And they consult, and Joseph says, Nevertheless, I have to talk to a prophet. You remember when he talked to the prophet? They go and talk to the prophet, and he says, you go into battle, Israel's going to be without a king. They're going to be like sheep without a shepherd. And he says, I told you they don't like me, Jehoshaphat. Tell me, tell me what I want to hear. He said, okay, go ahead and go into battle. You're going to be fine. <laughs> You're going to die anyway. That was Micaiah, the prophet. And Micaiah, and he puts Micaiah on bread and water, and God says, and God says, in a figurative way, the Bible says, he calls his angel and says, which one of you will be a lying spirit in the mouth of one of his prophets to get him into battle? One of the angels of the Lord steps forward and says, I'll be a lying spirit in his mouth. And he consults one of his own priests of Baal, he says, you're going to win the battle. And he goes into battle. And he says, Jehoshaphat, trade, trade clothes with me so they won't know who I am. Now, Jehoshaphat 
as godly as he was, he had a twisted mind sometimes. You're, I'm going to put on your clothes so they'll think you're me and I'm you. Sure. And who are they after? They're after Ahab. So they can shoot me, but Jehoshaphat consents to it. I can't understand that. And they come chasing Jehoshaphat across the meadow where they're fighting the battle. And the Syrians say, you're not who we want. Get out of here. And they couldn't find Ahab because he has on Jehoshaphat's clothing. So God causes a man to draw a bow at a venture and go. And he goes, shoot. And Jehoshaphat's in his chariot going. He goes, thunk. Right in the harness of Jehoshaphat. And he falls to the ground. He's bleeding, huh? Ahab, not Oh, excuse me, Ahab. Ahab, not Jehoshaphat. But it hits Ahab in between the harness. He, blood starts coming out, just like Elijah the prophet said would happen. And he dies. And God got him. God created some calculus. He created a curve with the speed of the chariot and with the speed of the arrow and made the man draw the bow at a... It was an upright bow. The word adventure means... It's the word tamim means upright. It was an upright arrow. It did the righteousness of God. God had that man pull the bow back with a certain amount of pounds of force at a certain trajectory, and it just went out to thud. And this is the way... Jehoshaphat met his demise. Hey, jo Ahab, thank you for correcting me. I got too many names going on in my head. You know that, don't you? Ahab. It's the way Ahab met his demise. And Jehoshaphat dies later. But it's an adventurous story. Am I out of time? This, this is quite an adventure. I want you to understand that... The way God made a way for Moses is the same way he made a way for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was bound to the will of God. Moses was bound to God's direction and God's instruction. When we do that, quit worrying about how your life's going to turn out. It's going to turn out good. It may not, it's not going to be according to your way like the charismatics. God, I want a new Cadillac and a new, no, God may give you a new bicycle. He may give you a used bicycle. But it'll be the will of God. What he'll do, he changes your mind is what he does to accept what comes. He's made me more content at the things I'm doing than I ever thought I could be in any of the dreams that I had. God's not here to let you have your dreams. He's instructing you. He's going to fight your battle. He, first of all, he made your enemies rise up against you, didn't he? He ordains all things. He creates evil. He wants to burn out with your enemies your desire to be what you want to be. And he says, I've got your life instructed. It's going to be what I want. And when I get you there, you're going to be happy with it and you're going to be content. And he is our deliverer. He's the one who overcomes our enemies. We don't... The hard thing to do is learn to quit fighting your enemies. And your fight starts in your mind. It starts in your head. It doesn't start with your mouth. It starts here. And when, you can, when God gets, helps you get control of that and realize that he's working all things, he's working all things, if you can settle that in your mind, and that's not something you'll settle, it's something he'll settle in you in time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth. Help us to realize that the battle is yours, it's not ours. God, we praise you for everything that happens in our life. We know it's all for our good. We just don't see it, Lord, when we're at certain places in our life. I do thank you, Lord, for bringing me to this point. Lord, pray that you'll open up doors for the ministry and cause us to continue this work. Lead us to your elect, and we'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. Josephat, that's a good name to name your kid. He's a good man. Josephat Nasa. You can call him Josie or something. Yeah. Right? How you doing? I'm doing well, brother. I was wondering, are you still going to be able to make it down to the mission on Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m.? I can try. I, let me call you about that. Okay.
get with me on Friday and let's talk because I don't know what's happening. But